Since 2008, Rally Raid Products has been making some of the best enduro kit on the market, right here in Northamptonshire. <laughs> So really, you've got to wonder, why have they been taking an interest in my Africa Grom? Right, well, Rally Raid started really from my interest in motorcycles going back 40 years of trials, enduro, motocross, and then lately got into rallying. We went and did some rallies in Morocco, mainly on EXC, converted enduro bikes, and then we got into the KTM 690 enduro when it first came out, which was really a side shoot of the 690 rally bike. So for us, it was great, it got loads of power and uh, we, off we went really, and then re soon realised there was not a lot of aftermarket parts on, on the internet or in shops at the time. So as I already had an engineering business, we started developing our own parts for our own bikes for a group of friends. And uh, just thought I'd sell a few on eBay to start with and was swamped by the interest and from the worldwide interest. So. That was really what kick-started Rally Raid as a side shoot to the moulding and engineering business that we already had. Um, the Touareg Rally that I first did in 2008 on the EXC, that pr quickly progressed with the 690 the next year, and then we soon realised that you know the bike itself was a great rally bike with just a few alterations. So with the Evo 1 kit, which was a bigger tank, um, we also had a rear tank option for really long liaison days, and then a fairing with the road book and all the navigation equipment. Uh, that sold really well, it raced really well, and we then progressed onto an Evo 2 using all the things we'd found from the Evo 1, um, developed it even further. We then decided we were gonna to go to Dakar, and because the 690 is over the 450 limit, um, we, we didn't wanna go out and buy a 450, because the, base, the 690 was a really good rally bike anyway, it ticked all the boxes. The only thing that it didn't tick was the fact it was a 690. So we then decided to develop our own crankshaft and piston so that we could downsize the capacity from a 690, which was actually a 654, down to a 449cc by shortening the stroke of the engine by 25 millimeters, um, which took us a lot of work engineering wise but that's the sort of thing that we get a bit of a buzz out of to try and do something different and uh, it was a real good engineering exercise and it was a real experience to go to South America and uh, do the Dakar with our own bike. The KTM 690 uh, really started off the business as a rally kit but then we soon realised with the interest people were using that bike for overland and travelling that there was a bigger, even bigger market for an adventure kit so the rally kit quickly became an adventure kit and that then opened up the business to a whole new range of riders rather than competition riders we were getting more and more orders and interest from riders who were just traveling doing overland events just traveling on their own or, and they were looking for very heavy duty proven kit that worked for themselves so it was a, a fairly easy jump to go from rallying to adventure market. Um, and then we'd had a few years doing the KTM 690 and we realised the adventure market was a much bigger market than the, than the rally market. So we were looking around at different bikes that were coming out at the time. And the first one was the CB500, which uh, we realised was, although it was, wasn't sold by Honda as a mainstream adventure bike, we realised it pretty much got all the boxes ticked. The fact it was really reliable, reasonably inexpensive, um, parts were available worldwide and uh, although it was under most people's radar with a, we soon realised with a bit of work to the suspension that it, it really was a very good all-round travel bike so we quickly um, did some work on suspension, 
we made heavy duty spoked wheels and then the next thing was to go out and test the bike we'd done a bit of riding in the UK but then I went out to Australia and we did a two week trip around the Simpson Desert and the Outback all the other guys were tending to be on enduro based bikes and I just rode the ring off the little CB500 and it really didn't miss a beat and it proved that underneath the bike was a really good small adventure bike and that's the way we've been tending to look is the middleweight size of the market rather than the big bikes because most of our customers tend to be traveling solo so they're not looking for massive power they're actually looking for something that one they can pick up if they drop it and two that's got enough power but it's easy on tires easy on chains and easy on fuel which is when you're traveling that's the main requirement and as soon as you start looking at a bike that's doing all of those things, you, you suddenly realise you don't need massive fuel tanks, you don't need a lot of tyre changes because the bikes will perform with, the, with what they've got. And then a couple of years later, the BMW sort of surfaced and again it was something we were looking at. We went and tried the OEM bike as it was and again, it was similar to the Honda, it was pretty good basic bike but it still stopped short in the fact it had alloy wheels, fairly budget suspension, the riding position wasn't that brilliant stood up. So we did a similar thing to what we did with the Honda, we did the spoke wheels, tractive suspension helped us to upgrade. We uh, came up with some different footrest, uh, different bar position to help with the standing up which you tend to be doing when you're off-road. And then the next thing again was to test it and we're quite limited in the UK with off-road riding. We've got lots of lanes but there's not really anywhere you can go for a week or two and really hammer the bike. So Adam went out to Australia and did a APC rally off-road. Yeah, it was an eight-day rally. Um, majority of the bikes again were 690s, 990s, sort of DR450s. So far put more performance based than the BMW but after our sort of upgrades and R&D development into the bike that we had at that point, uh, it stood the test didn't miss a beat uh, and it was really capable and against the bigger bikes just down to its sort of weight and agility which is sort of key, key for solo riders. It was good to say that after the event Adam flew back but he was riding with Amy Harburg who works for BMW Australia and then she shipped her 310 with our kit on to Mongolia for the BMW uh, rally so she was uh, working there as an instructor with her 1200 GS but then straight after, she unloaded the 310 from the container as it finished the APC rally and rode the bike all the way from Mongolia back to the factory here in Wollaston on her own, which proves that, you know, after 20... And when she got here, the bike had done, what, 27,000? 27, yeah. 27,000 kilometres, and it had only had oil changes and filters. So for the future, we've uh, been lucky to work with some really good partners. Um, we've learnt a lot, and we've realised that... Uh, you don't have to supply a full kit to convert a bike. There's, there's bikes that are out there like the Africa Twin where we've done uh, mainly just wheels and suspension um, that you can do. So we don't have to completely convert a bike. You can just look at a bike and say, well, actually it's 90% there, but it's got some shortfalls and they're the ones that we can address from an engineering point of view. We can bring the bike in, ride it off-road, work out what it needs and pretty quickly we can come up with a solution um, and s sometimes it, it works from a sales point of view but sometimes it, it's too niche so you just have to weigh it up as you go along but going forward we've got some really good projects going with the new Yamaha T7 10 or 8 and then we're always looking out at new models that are coming to the market um, for the future. taking the easy yeah. option and it's because you can do it a lot of the time people yeah. say why do you do it it's because you can yeah it doesn't have to be a better reason than that
remember when I first came here? It was with Nathan to do a feature with you guys about. Uh, I think it's about the CB500. CB500. Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I remember pulling up on my KTM 1050 Adventure and I wobbled up and saw John sitting there and thought, shit, he's like proper, a, a proper rider and I'm wobbling around like an idiot. And I went up to him saying, yeah, look, I'm sorry I wobbled up, but I've been riding this MSX 125 for two weeks, so I've like, got used to small bikes. And he went, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam's, Adam's got one of them, he's making spoke wheels for it. And that was it. But to me, that was, I've got, to, I've got to buy a Grom in America and make an off-road Grom. And it turned out, you'd have been doing it, hadn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I brought the Grom pretty much as soon as they came out. Just, I yeah. fell in love with it. I'm not really a small bike person, but as soon as I saw it, I was like, yeah, I definitely want one of those. Why uh, though? Because you are you are a proper enduro rider, aren't you? Yeah, but I've, uh, I've always liked the, the pit bike sort of thing. I'm not really a monkey bike person, but the Grom yeah. had everything, the styling that I wanted, the sort of 12 inch chunky wheel, supermoto style. Yeah. So that was definitely a big factor of it. And then Probably about a week after I got it, I started taking it down the green lanes and off-roading and treating it a bit like an enduro bike sort of thing. So I started looking into ways to make it better. That's what we do here. So yeah. I started looking into ways to make it better off-road. Yeah. Uh, there's not much that can be done with the suspension on the Grom. So I started looking at sort of styling stuff and obviously wheels. spoke wheels is something that we make in-house here. So I thought I'm in a pretty good position to actually put these on a, a bike that would never have an opportunity to have yeah. a set of sort of... So you make them all here, don't you? You're yeah, so the hubs uh, we machine here um, in-house, uh, the, the rims uh, obviously purchased in, that's the specialist thing in itself. Yep. Uh, and then we do the assembly up in Birmingham, so we have a group central wheels up in Birmingham and they deal with the uh, lacing and truing of the, right. the hubs, because again that's quite a specialised job in yeah. itself. Yeah. Uh, and we focus on sort of the precision mach machine inside of it here and then uh, outsource the building. But how, how do you go about, I mean it's, it's awesome, it's beautiful, but how do you how do you know what to make? Um, Start. Where do you start with it? I guess we have some help in the sense that we've already been producing spoked wheels for the 310 and the uh, 500 for a couple of years. Yeah. So we've kind of had a test run on those. Um, building a wheel this size is a bit of a headache because yeah. um, we've got such a wi wide rim profile on them. Yeah. Um, sort of getting such a wide rim profile on such a small diameter wheel is yeah. a bit of a headache in that sense. So there's a lot of uh, testing and sort of back and forth in that area yeah. um, but once we'd sort of had a bit of measure up you, you brought your grum down and we'd yeah. sort of just decided what I want them to be like um, yeah. and there were some limitations things like the spokes you couldn't have a straight pull spoke which is what we originally wanted so that would be similar to sort of the EXC enduro bikes. Yeah. Um, Why is that important? A straight pull gives you a lot a lot stronger sort of tension around the wheel there more durable than a 90 degree pulled spoke right. but unfortunately due to the size of the wheels you have to go for a 90 degree on, on this sort of design okay. um, which is it's, it's still completely strong I mean this size wheel with a heavy duty rim on it and stainless spokes is going to be indestructible but um, yeah. if for styling reasons it would have been a bit nice to have a straight pull but unfortunately that's just part of development. That, that was the first challenge wasn't it with this because the original Grom had, didn't have ABS yeah. so the rear wheel's exactly the same isn't it? But the front wheel now has this. Look at it here. We've yeah. got this ABS ring, haven't we? So I wanted to keep ABS in mind. You've got the original Grom. Yeah. I've got the new one. Mm -hmm. um, what? What? Did it, but th this wheel will fit both, won't it? Uh, yeah. So our hubs are universal. Yeah. It's worth, I think, taking the time when you're developing something to try and make it as universal as it can be, just because yeah. it saves on having to machine lots of different parts. Yeah. Um, but you know, the, the Grom's quite a bit of a headache in terms of the newer ones because it's such a small wheel, you've got a big brake caliper on there, there's not a whole lot of room to work with compared to the larger bikes. Yeah. So actually getting the uh, sort of ABS configuration in that small space is quite hard. Yeah. I would have happily done non-ABS, but it seems like if you're going to have a Grom, <laughs> you, you might as well not have ABS on one. But uh, obviously yeah. the newer ones come pre-fitted with ABS, so we have to account for that as well. And they're actually the same as the monkey bikes, aren't they? They're yeah, so these will also fit uh, on the new monkey 125s, yeah, yeah. Um, which is quite cool. I know there's a lot of people out there that are maybe upgrading from old monkey bikes to new ones, and they've kept the whole sort of fan thing going. Yeah. So uh, these look pretty cool on a monkey as well. We've had them uh, on one of the new ones. Yeah. But for me, it's the Grom. I mean, you can get cheap Chinese wheels, can't you? And you, I think you guys have had a fiddle with them. Yeah. So. When I first wanted a set of spoke wheels, I thought I'd take a pop at some on the internet. There's only one pair available, yeah. uh, so the same pair through multiple sellers. Yeah. So I just found the cheapest uh, seller on them and they arrived and 
They're pretty awful to be fair in terms of their quality, but they were so cheap and you generally get what you pay for. Yeah, um, yeah. So once I'd sort of fitted them on my bike, they didn't really fit very well yeah. and the machining quality was quite poor on them. Um, so I thought, I guess I better start looking at making my own ones. Yeah. So this is the first set, isn't it? And you, there's bits you want to refine on it. For, so I've managed to convince you to let me buy this set um, and you're still to make your own set, you? Yeah, yeah. So it, in fact, this is the fourth set we've done. Oh, right. Um, but the other ones are early development and we just couldn't get the rims, originally sourcing the rims at the right profile because of the uh, size they are. Yeah. Getting a 3.5 rim um, folded around to that sort of size is actually quite hard to do in terms yeah. of engineering. So we're fairly limited on sort of what, what we could do with the rims, but we uh, ended up lucking out and we managed to get the full sort of chunky wide rims on there. So, I mean, I know you've been, obviously you came on the development for the Africa Twin, you've had a lot of stuff happening with the GS. Yeah. I mean, when I first came over, we first talked about this. I mean, it was a good couple of years ago, weren't it? Yeah, I think two years uh, ago now. So you've been doing a lot of stuff since. So how, when have you made these? Just tea breaks after work. Yeah. You know, it's just one of those things that if you really want it, you'll build it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the construction really is the key part of the quality of these Grom wheels. Um, so again, machined in-house, the hubs, that's took us a long time to get them Sort of especially in terms of design um, where we want them because yeah. if they're going to go on a Grom they've got to look cool. Yeah. Uh, stainless spokes, uh, oversized stainless spokes actually they're called Bulldog spokes, they're imported from the US right. so they're a slightly oversized diameter compared to normal spokes which reinforces that whole chunky adventure feeling. Yeah. Um, ni nickel plated um, nipples which again is a longevity and quality thing. A lot of bikes just come with stainless or mild steel nipples that have been plated. But so the, why is nickel plated better than stainless? Um, nickel is a very long-term sort of solution to plating. It's it's far more resistant um, because stainless will eventually not through the stainless itself, but the dirt and sort of oil that gets stuck in the stainless. Whereas the nickel plating is a very uh, very clean, right. very clean finish for a long time. So well, these are they kind of a they're quite frivolous, really. Aren't yeah, they? they're very overspec for what yeah, they're going in. But, but I guess that, that's the thing with everything you've made here. I mean, every time I've been here, you, I think you take for granted what, what you're capable of and what you're making. It's like, it's like this is done proper, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I, I guess, you know, this just carries on the technology and the, the, what you do in your Africa Twin wheels, your GS wheels, your CB500X wheels. Yeah, and I think we're all quite proud of the fact that we're sort of a UK-based yeah. production company making stuff that is of sort of a quality to be noticed worldwide. Yeah. Um, I mean it's very small here, there's only a few of us here and everything's done out of the passion for it. Yeah. And I think that kind of shows with the quality that we put into our stuff, even on the sort of part-time part projects, yeah. like the Grom wheels and stuff like that, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it as best as you can, yeah. uh, even if it takes two years. <laughs> Um, you still got to make your set. I still got to make my set, and if there was someone out there that was sort of really committed uh, it, it, to their Grom and they had the same sort of passion, I, I probably would. Um, but for the time being, in terms of my time commitments, they are a, a project that I have to keep outside of the uh, yeah. work hours. Yeah. Because um, there's people waiting for other wheels, so. <laughs> I can't people spend. going around the world, aren't Yeah, you? there's not many people out there doing world trips on the Grom, so I have to keep the other people happy. But uh, if I do get some time, it'd be nice to run some run some more of these. I'd, I'd definitely like to see them in a supermoto setup as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'd, that'd be really yeah, that'd cool. Be cool. Some nice supermoto slicks on them. Maybe we need two sets each. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs>